Springtime for Monza and Styria. I'm a Mel Brooks fan, come on. Best served cold is the first First Law standalone book I am reviewing here on the channel. I have reviewed the First Law trilogy and the first book in the new trilogy being released, A Little Hatred, and I'm a big fan. If you've been paying attention at all, I'm constantly praising Joe Abercrombie's character work, his tone, consistency, all these things. And so I don't want to really focus on any of those things because I think it's important to kind of highlight a different aspect of an author's abilities with each review. I certainly don't want to sound redundant. So we're going to focus a lot on the plot here of this story, which of course will inevitably touch on character and world. But I feel like plot is something a lot of people accidentally write off from Joe Abercrombie because his first book in this series, The Blade Itself, admittedly has the weakest plot of any First Law book. The book is still ridiculously good because of how forefront the personality of the characters are, but overall, yeah, it's a bit uh, what really is going on here in terms of why aren't we progressing with some real momentum through this story. From there though, First Law explodes its abilities with plot, having some of the most convoluted and interesting character arcs really being the pushing force to reaching the conclusion of this journey we are going down, the overall narrative, and that all blends together to great effect. And I think overall Abercrombie's work really does have some magnificent plot lines to them. Now, best served cold on premise sounds like it might be the first time that a plot line from Joe Abercrombie might be predictable. It's a revenge tale. To set it up without getting into late in book spoilers, just the very beginning paces, a mercenary Monza and her brother Benna, I, I read the book and I'm dyslexic, so sorry, are very successful mercenaries who, of course, in Joe Abercrombie fashion, are showed to us to not be the most morally righteous individuals, but they are our main characters. They're so successful, though, that the Duke they work for, Grand Duke Orso, becomes worried that there might be a plot to overthrow him, usurp his position, which is something that has happened in his family line. So, you know, he's nervous about that. And there's a throwaway thing said by Benna that accidentally makes this paranoia reach a point where Orso betrays Menzo, Monza, Monza, Jesus. And from there, we have the beginnings of our revenge tale. Her brother is killed, she is thrown off a battlement, and she must recover. And as time moves on and the revenge cools down, we have our revenge best serve cold. I tried to work in the title there, it didn't work, but I, I did my best. And she's teaming up with some people she knows, but not in your typical band of oddballs fashion because they're all, uh, Sociopaths, it's first law, so of course they are. Now this setup and premise, aside from maybe the sociopaths angle to it might seem super predictable, like you've seen it a million times. But the thing is, Joe Abercrombie throughout this story does not focus where you think the revenge tale is going to focus. And he takes the idea of a revenge tale down avenues I really haven't seen before. Suddenly also to the forefront of this story, Abercrombie has really pushed the morality of his characters to literal questions being asked. One character is asking, why are we not trying to be better? Why are we being the good guys? And that mentality is punished throughout this story. We actually see how this world that has been built for us, the first law world, destroys people who try and be better. So suddenly, Best Serve Cold is explaining to the reader why the first law universe is so rough, so gritty, and I appreciated that. We get a explanation, A, B, C, D, of how people who try and preach this method uh, don't really win. The good guys aren't gonna come out on top. The lesser of evils in a morally gray spectrum might. And beyond that, we also have this crew disagreeing over the methods of murdering all the people involved with this revenge. Like, they're accidentally killing too many, and some people have problems with that, while others really don't, and that kind of creates an internal conflict I enjoy. There's betrayal trail in the group, all kinds of love, and almost a typical fantasy romance totally flipped on its head. All of these story elements, I think, are what goes underappreciated when Abercrombie is talked about a lot of the time, because people hyper-focus on his character. Don't get me wrong, they should. But he also utilizes these characters within his story to what I would consider the maximum effect. You can see a great character built and then not 
do a whole lot that feels like they're living up to their potential. A lot of authors are guilty of that, actually. But that doesn't seem to be the case here. Abercrombie has the ability to, within a book, like Monza herself, I understand as a character better than some characters I've read in series that are five, six books long. And that's because Abercrombie respects them as individuals and is consistent with how they will present themselves. I'm slipping into praising character again. Damn it, I said I wouldn't do that. Let me just quickly wrap that up by saying I'm often pulled out of character from authors as they will rapidly make a decision I don't think fits that character what they are established for. My recent negative review of Nevernight is an example of that. While I found the characters to be very personality filled, I don't think I mentioned this review, but there were a couple of things as far as I got in that book that felt like wrong for the character. Like this doesn't make entire sense for them. I have not experienced that in an Abercrombie book and that maintains true for Best Serve Cold. Every character who's established is built in a way where you can then follow their line of thought and think, yeah, this is that way that person's going to go without it ever feeling predictable because the world itself is so devious, so backhanded. There's even like ends to fights that are just jarring and surprising. Like, oh, that ended in a way that maybe in another author's hands would feel corny and unearned. But here, it just feels like, yeah, the world's chaotic and brutal and someone could die in a fight from just an outside influence of, oh, this this environment killed them in a way. Okay, that yeah, that happens in the real world. People fall in the middle of fights and die hitting their heads on rocks. Not that that's what happened here. I'm just giving an example. And maybe most impressively at all, Abercrombie, at the end of this story, doesn't deliver a satisfying ending deliberately, but because of how it's delivered, I actually enormously enjoyed it. I can't get into more specifics without spoilers, and I do actually want to talk spoilers for Best Serve Cold. If I haven't sold you on it already, if I haven't sold you on First Law already, I don't know what more I can do. I'm not a Grimdark fan, and I love these books. They are Grimdark, but they're so technically well built and the consistency is so strong that Abercrombie now, while he may not be my favorite author of all time, he's the one who I am most confident in will just continue to deliver this level of quality because I haven't seen him waver in the slightest. I'm always fascinated by who he's building, but for Best Serve Cold for the first time, and it makes me want to go back and reread all of First Law, honestly, I really found myself paying as much attention to the beats of the story and how well the characters were causing them, setting them up, and reacting to them. I've had a lot of people tell me that the standalone First Law books are the best ones by far. You're going to love them way more than you do the original trilogy. I didn't find that to be necessarily the case. I found it to be as much as I love the rest of First Law, which is a good thing. I think First Law is one of the best fantasy series of all time, in my opinion, subjectively, and this was just another entry that lived up to it. So I'm not entirely sure where these people who are saying that the standalones are exponentially better than the original trilogy are coming from. Uh, I found them to be on par, which is excellence. It's great. But let's go ahead and transition into spoilers here for a minute. Uh, very vague ones that aren't entirely, you need to click off the video, but I wanna to touch on the fact that uh, Abercrombie as well is an author who will always have consequences in his story for characters. There is going to be damage done or death inflicted upon people who are built up for us. And he's not afraid to spend a lot of energy to build someone even if they are just going to be killed off a few chapters later. Uh, because you can often tell, like, if you're introduced to a band of people and you're like, oh, this is that guy, that's that guy. This guy, we don't know much about him. He's the expendable one who's going to die. Like, Suicide Squad's the cliche example of it, right? Where you have that dude whose, like, ability was ropes, and then he just f died. And that was his character. You'll never have that level of predictability here. Because everyone is understood. Everyone is justified. Everyone is fleshed out. And then... Who knows what's going to happen? And I also just love the destruction of a morality of a character that's trying to do better, who's trying to rise above, and this world will not let that happen. This world will smack you down for that. And it just makes sense. It didn't feel over the top. It didn't feel unnecessary. It felt like what would happen. It, as a reader, I was just going, like, as soon as this guy started mouthing off of, like, we need to do, I was like, no, man, this is not the time or place. Cut the sh <laughs> and now I want to talk into end of book spoilers. So if you have not read it or do not want it spoiled for you, click off. Navi, do your sound bite. Get out of here. Spoiler warning. Vamoose. So the ending. There is not much fanfare given to killing the final big bad guy. It's almost lackadaisical. No fanfare. No grand epic duel. Just, yeah, kill him. Stab him. He's dead now. And that's kind of something I appreciate. When I first read it, I was just kind of sitting there like, what just happened? That can't be it. 
oh, that's it. Yeah, that makes sense. That fits. That's right. And it's satisfying in a very questioning way because we have a character who realized their motivations weren't as justified as they thought they were. And we had an execution still take place. And I would have been very upset now thinking back on it if she had the typical fantasy, like drops the knife and is like, I forgive you and walks away. Like that wouldn't have fit in any way, shape or form. The themes of this book forced her hand and who she is as a character to follow through. And that makes sense. Like it wasn't a complete forgiveness. It was just an understanding that, well, maybe things were a bit more muddled than originally she thought. The Duke realized, no, she wasn't trying to usurp her. And she realized also that, yeah, there's a lot of paranoia here and it makes sense that he kind of did what he did. Benno was planning something and she wasn't necessarily involved, but the guy had a right to do what he did. The only way I can like think to describe like the vibe I got reading this scene, it was like in one of those like smarter sitcoms where they're able to execute like awkward comedy well, except it wasn't funny. It was just awkward having them be like, I just, ah, and then she was still just like, yeah, I'm still gonna fucking. That takes cojones as an author to not only conceive of, but execute. And then it takes a whole lot of skill to execute it well, that is why First Law is special, because it's never going to be predictable. It's going to go places that other fantasy stories won't. Not in like the risky Stephen King way, where Stephen King will try to end his story with like a, waha, and you're like, that sucked. But it's consistently going to be a, waha, and you're going to go, bah! from the big Baez reveals to this. I don't think First Law will ever struggle with enamoring a reader in its storyline. So I'm glad that I read this book so that I could refocus my praise for Joe Abercrombie away from character, which has deserved every ounce of praise it gets online, but also K say no, but he's also working these characters in the storyline as well as you could possibly imagine. So, hey, hats off to him. I also just want to take a minute to praise Joe Abercrombie's prose because that's been something I've been wanting to take a closer examination of as I've been doing more book reviews recently. And the guy has a way with words that is so distinctly first law that if you took a bunch of random passages from the series and threw them on a page with a bunch of others, I bet fans could pick out the first law ones. One that really specifically stood out to me in this that I really enjoyed was the dead can forgive. The dead can be forgiven. The rest of us have better things to do. That's so first law to me. I don't know why, but it's just like, hell yeah, man. And it's poetic in a way that I feel like a lot of other authors will accidentally overdo, which will destroy the appeal, or they just can't even come close to begin with. So that is my review of Best Served Cold. Maybe my favorite first law book yet, but not by a huge margin. I mean, they're all so neck and neck. I would say the blade itself might be my least favorite, but again, I still consider that awesome. Uh, let me know what you thought of this review in the comments down below. Let me know if you love first law or you hate it. Let me know if you push past the blade itself or if you're curious to do so now you've heard me talk about the series more in detail. Uh, all that stuff right down there. And like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. And have a good one, y'all. Peace. And of course, I'd like to record a special shout out to my three latest high tier Patreons. Anders Havidston. I think I said that right. Anders Havidston. George Justin Morell. And... Francois T. Francis T. Is that like a fancy Francis? I'm not sure, but it's spelled Francois T. <laughs> I hope you guys are having a good one. Thanks for the support. Peace.